Thank you so much for being here. There we are. This is our third uh, month uh, since we're doing our think tank. Um, my name is Cecilia Venosta Weigel. I'm now uh, the president of the Center for the Women of New York. Um, I'm here with uh, Victoria Pilotti, who organizes the think tank. Thank you so much, Victoria, for putting this together. We have amazing presenters. We have Eric Crossbaum today, who is the ADA Chief Special uh, of Special Victims Borough uh, from uh, the Queens County District Attorney's Office, and Lindsay Curtis. Uh, from the outreach and training program. So she is the outreach and training program supervisor for Mount Sinai Sexual Assault and Violence Intervention, Intervention Program, the SAVI. Um, I will let Victoria introduce them formally. Um, so uh, in case you're not familiar with the Center for the Women of New York, the Center for the Women of New York helps women overcome financial violence, um, social wellness and legal issues by raising awareness and advocating for full gender equality for women, understanding their needs and connecting them with CWNY services, uh, nonprofit partner organizations and public resources to aid, uplift and address their challenges. Uh, now I will turn it over to Victoria. I'm so looking forward to hearing um, our, the presentations. Uh, we will try to keep it to one hour. We know that um, you know, your time is valuable. So the last, I think, Victoria, uh, 15, 20 minutes will be open uh, to questions and we will try to leave with an action for our organization. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, they will be addressed uh, after the presentation. If you email, if, if you are joining via email, uh, you can uh, send your um, questions to events at cwny.org uh, and Lana, our amazing volunteer, will be monitoring the email. So your address, your, your uh, questions will be addressed. Victoria, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much again for putting this together. Thank you, Cecilia. So everyone, if you don't know, today is Denim Day. And um, although we're on Zoom and we cannot see our uh, genes in solidarity for this sex sexual assault awareness day, I am wearing a jeans shirt. So uh, I would like to introduce our uh, first presenter. Lindsay Curtis is the Training, Outreach, and Education Supervisor of Mount Sinai Sexual Assault and Violence Intervention Program. Lindsay has been committed to anti-violence work in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York since 2016. She has served in a variety of capacities from hotline work, advocacy, prevention education, and more. Currently working in New York City, she is focused on prevention work, operating as the training, outreach, and education supervisor for SAVI. She has previously served as a sexual violence advocate for services empowering rights of victims, Center for Family Services, Cumberland County, and has previously presented at National Sexual Assault Conference and the JBWS Conference. A little bit about the SAVI program. It was founded in 1984 as the Rape Crisis Intervention Program. From its inception, it recognized how paramount it was to provide services that address the needs of survivors, especially women and girls, with limited resources or limited access to them. Over time, many of these individuals and their loved ones have returned to support and develop the program by sharing experiences, skills, and time. Through this input, the, rec the recognition of the changing needs of survivors, the mission of SAVI has become threefold. To meet the needs of rape, sexual assault, and domestic violence survivors by offering intermediate crisis, immediate crisis intervention in hospital emergency rooms. To follow up with psychotherapy, counseling, and information both from past, for past and present survivors and their families and friends. 
to educate the public and professionals regarding services and issues of sexual and domestic violence. Our second presenter, Eric Rosenbaum, is the Assistant District Attorney Chief, Special Victims Bureau in Melinda Katz, Queens District Attorney's Office. Eric Rosenbaum has been a prosecutor in Queens County since 1994 and was promoted to Chief of the Special Victims Bureau in 2020 by DA Melinda Katz. Prior to becoming Bureau Chief, Eric served as a Deputy in Chief in SVB, Senior Trial Assistant, and Chief of DNA Prosecutions for the Queens DA. Eric is a Senior Legislative Advisor to the District Attorneys Association of New York State for which he co-chairs the Legislative Committee on Special Victims and Domestic Violence. During his ten tenure at the Queens DA's office, Eric has also served through the U.S. Department of State and UNICEF as a legal advisor to the Jordanian Family Proctorate and Judiciary remain regarding law enforcement and judicial responses to gender-based violence and child abuse, and to the government of Malawi regarding efforts to establish one-stop child advocacy centers throughout the country. In recent years, Eric has developed trauma-informed survivor-centric training courses for prosecutors throughout New York State. He also lectures in New York and nationally on advanced trial advocacy, special victims prosecutions, and forensic DNA best practices. Uh, before we move to our first presenter, Lindsay, I want to thank you both for taking this time on such a busy day. Uh, Blue Denim Day is a very big day for those who advocate for uh, prevention and intervention on sexual assault. So thank you both so much. And a reminder, please do add your questions to the uh, chat or, and uh, your questions will be answered after both presenters have presented. Welcome, Lindsay. Hi, thank you so much for having me and for that introduction. Let me get my slides ready. It is a busy day, but it's always a yes, especially for Victoria, who reached out to me to come join for this panel. All right, so let's look into a little bit about what I hope to cover in this limited amount of time. I'd love to give you a little bit of a, an overview of the impact of sexual violence what does a trauma-informed response look like? And what are the resources for survivors in the community? Okay, so let's take a look at this. Victoria you did a great job introducing the Mount Sinai Savvy program. So just to remind everyone, we are here for the community. We are completely free and confidential. There is no insurance question. There is no immigration question, right? All of our services are completely free to the public. We support survivors of sexual violence, domestic violence, and sex trafficking in the community. We have a great emergency room advocacy program for those who might be interested in volunteering with us where we send volunteers out to support survivors in their time of need in the emergency department. And we have outreach training education, which is what I do. I oversee a team of two full-time educators who work on 10 college campuses across the city. And we also do a lot of education on health relationships, consent, and more, as well as working with professionals who may encounter survivors in their work. So OBGYNs, doctors, um, people who work with at-risk populations and more. Here are just a few of the hospitals we serve. So we send advocates and coordinate the SAFE program, which are forensic examiners to 10 hospitals around New York City. And there are many more hospitals that do this work and that's the link right there to find out more information. Okay. Let's get right into it, okay. So we, are looking at an affirmative consent model, which is where I like to begin when I talk about sexual violence, because so many people have varying definitions of what sexual violence is, what is consent, right? Everyone gets a different level of education as well. Some people receive no education about sexual consent, some receive a lot, and the message has changed over time, right? Maybe when you were in school, the message was no means no, right? So when you're looking for sexual consent, a clear no means no. But now we're looking at a different model, which I think fits much better with our view of healthy, happy, consensual sexual encounters, right? Affirmative consent is a knowing, voluntary, and mutual decision among all participants to engage in sexual activity, 
Consent can be given by words or actions, as long as those words or actions create clear permission regarding the willingness to engage in that sexual activity, right? So let's look at this a little closer. I like to say that consent is a conversation, it's not a contract, right? It has to be active and explicit. The definition doesn't depend on the circumstances. So just because you're in a relationship or in a marriage doesn't mean that consent is no longer important. Each time some sexual activity is initiated, there needs to be a conversation around consent. The onus is on the initiator. And what that means is if I'm seeking consent from somebody else, if I'm seeking a hug, some kind of sexual contact, it's up to me to make sure that person's giving consent, right? It has to be renewed each time. So it doesn't matter if someone was okay with something yesterday or two hours ago, there needs to be a conversation each time about what that person's comfortable with and what they want to do. This can be withdrawn at any time, right? If someone is halfway through a sexual activity and is no longer into it, that's when that activity should stop, right? We should be having active conversations with our partners to make sure that person is into what's going on the entire time. Um, that's when that situation ends. And if someone continues to pressure somebody else to finish or to keep going, this is kind of a form of coercion, right? Can't be given by someone who's incapacitated physically or due to drugs or other substance consumption. So in other words, if someone is not in the right mental state to give consent, they can't. Um, people may jump to think uh, being drugged is very common when it comes to sexual assault, but actually alcohol is the most commonly used form uh, of substances used during the course of sexual assault, okay? And a course, yes, does not equal consent. What does that mean? Well, there's a lot of different forms of coercion and pressure that can happen in a sexual situation. That can include wearing someone down over time, um, making someone feel trapped or afraid, making someone feel guilty, threatening to break up with someone, threatening to share explicit photos of them with their community, right? Whether that's within their schools, within their sharing them with family, right? These are some threats that can lead to coercion. Um, and I just want to remind everyone, these aren't the legal definitions of consent. These are just the ways that we try to talk about this as sexual violence prevention experts. We also must always consider the power differential. What if the person asking for sex is the landlord and a tenant? What if it's an employer and an employee? What if it's a teacher and a student relationship, right? These power differentials can create unsafe situations. So let's take a deeper look into what is sexual violence. Sexual assault is unwanted or unwelcome touching of a sexual nature that occurs without consent, right? We usually define rape as unwanted penetration of any kind that could be oral, anal, vaginal, or other. It could be sexual harassment, which could be unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, or other verbal, nonverbal, or physical conduct of a sexual nature. This could include leering, non-consensual photo sharing, and more, right? There's many forms of sexual harassment. All of these things could be occurring at once, right? Involved in, in a dynamic of sexual violence. Sexual assault. So what makes this different from other crimes? Sexual violence is a pervasive public health issue. It's an act of violence where sex is used as the weapon. Stigma and a shame associated with the assault, right? Society tends to look for the victim's contribution to the assault or abuse. What was the victim doing? Why were they there? Why were they wearing that? And more. Healing from trauma is a lifelong journey, right? Here at Savvy, we treat anyone who has experienced that kind of harm. I believe we had someone who was 80 years old come in for counseling who had experienced childhood sexual abuse. So that kind of healing can take a long time. And there's different stages in life where someone may return to that healing process, right? Definitions of sexual assault and violence vary and create confusion in gray areas for survivors and providers. The definitions we just looked at are the ones I use for campus definitions of sexual violence, right? A police station may use different definitions. Um, if you read the news, you may see headlines like sexual misconduct. Well, what does that really mean, right? It can happen to anyone. The rights and resources are often unknown to the survivor. What is the school policy? What are the reporting options? What are the medical options? Unlike most other crimes, most victims know the person who committed the act of violence against them. This is a crime that happens between two people who know each other behind closed doors. I think 80% of survivors knew the perpetrator. There's no right way to react in a crisis. Survivors will present in many different ways, just like there's no right way to heal. What is the difference between sex and rape? I think this is something that society still really struggles with, so I like to look at this. Sex is consensual. Hopefully it brings pleasure to body and spirit. It's comfortable. It's positive, right? It's an act of shared intimacy. It's a collaboration. And what is rape? Rape is forced. It's a violation of body and spirit. It leads someone feeling scared and sad, and it's an act of power and control of one person over another. 
one of the main myths about rape is that it's really about sexual desire and overwhelming sexual desire is what causes rape, but actually it's an act of power and control and an act of violence. What is the prevalence? Over half of women, these are from the CDC, have experienced some sexual violence involving physical contact in her lifetime. Almost one in three men have experienced sexual violence involving physical contact, right? We're not just talking about verbal, during his lifetime. This is an estimation that I think is really important to look at as we look at this as a public health issue. The estimated lifetime cost of a rape is $122,000 per victim, right? Lost wages, the counseling that may be needed, follow-up medical care and more. Repeat victimization is common. One of the main risk factors for sexual assault is having previously experienced sexual violence. So it's not uncommon to hear someone has experienced multiple assaults in her lifetime. This is a statistic that came out pretty recently that I like to share as well. So this is since the pandemic, right? The CDC has been taking information about what is going on with teenagers, right? Um, among teenage girls, there's a stunning statistic. In 2021, nearly 20% said they had been victims of violent sexual behavior more than one in 10 had been raped. While women of all ages have long endured a disproportionate number of sexual assaults compared to men, a closer look at the CDC data reveals that the number of young girls forced into sex grew by nearly 200,000 in just two years, right? We're looking at an increase in harm. We can, if we have more time or you can put it in the questions. Why is that? What leads to that? What are the risk factors there? The CDC's Youth Risk Behavior Survey is given to more than 17,000 US high school students every year. Based on the responses in 2019, an estimated 850,000 high school girls had reported they've been raped. By 2021, that went up to 1 million, right? That's 150,000 jump. Coercive control and intimidation exists along with all types of abuse. Acts perceived by recipient as violent or threatening, recipient's fear of attack or retaliation, threats could be altered with kindness, right? We're talking about dynamics of power and control that we see across society. I do like to mention that like the statistic says that 80% of survivors know their perpetrator, sexual violence can occur within an intimate partner violence dynamic, right? IPV involves a pattern of intentional coercive behavior one part by one partner against the other as a means to gain power and control over them. This can include physical abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse, and more. This also includes sexual abuse that can happen within this dynamic, right? So what is that survivor's experience? We've talked about what the definition is. We visited the numbers, right? So what is that survivor experiencing? Here's the little kind of example of, of what might be said, right? So survivor says, I think I was raped. Something happened to me, but I don't remember everything. Here's the authority provider and police response. It was a red flag. She was able to give me details and talk nonstop all the way until we got to the assault. Then she said five words and moved on. I knew then that her story wasn't adding up. This is the survivor responding. Why are you asking what I was wearing and where I was? I know you don't believe me and think it was my fault, right? We're gonna talk now about what happens when someone is experiencing trauma and what happens within the brain, right? Why would it lead to someone not remembering details about an event, not remembering how long something took, right? These are things that can make it really difficult for the police to understand that I've worked with in my experience helping train officers and other providers who might hear disclosure to say sometimes these stories they need a lot more um, conversation to understand, right? So what is trauma? What's actually happening in the brain during an assault? Individual trauma results from an event, series of events, or set of circumstances experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening with lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being, right? So it's when events cause trauma, it's the experience of trauma, and it's the effect of trauma. Here's a little diagram of the brain. I'm gonna do my best to explain this, but I am an educator who is not a brain scientist. So what happens when trauma meets the brain, right? There's an impaired prefrontal cortex flooded with neurochemicals like cortisol. That's when your decision-making process shuts down. Survival reflexes and reactions kick in. So we have freeze, fight, or flight. Many people have, may have heard of fight or flight as a survival instinct. But few have heard of freeze, right? But it's actually a very common response to sexual violence. Someone may completely freeze up and be able to, unable to move, yell, shout, or leave a room. Um, Self-protection habits may kick in to survive that experience. I think this is something that leads to a lot of victim blaming, both within that survivor and in a community. People may tell themselves, if this happened to me, I would get up and leave. If this happened to me, I would yell. I would get help. I would tell that person no, right? 
but actually the body may completely freeze and this is a very normal response. Common reactions to sexual violence. So there's the acute phase that may happen immediately after a sexual assault. Shock, disbelief, embarrassment, shame, self-blame. There could be poor concentration, right? Sleeplessness. And then in the long term, there are many, many health consequences, as well as mental emotional consequences. Avoidance, sleep disturbances, loss of appetite, difficulty concentrating, impulsiveness, re-experiencing, right? These are really big impacts and there are many um, physical impacts as well. Knowing all of this about how this kind of violence can impact a survivor for a lifetime, how do we go about supporting survivors in our community? First, we have to look at the barriers to report. What leaves someone to keep this to themselves, to fear reaching out, right? To fear reaching out to services, the fear of not being believed. Like I said, this is something that happens oftentimes between two people who know each other behind closed doors. And what is the implication there when they have to share that story? Repercussions by the perpetrator from their community. Negative responses from friends or family, right? Friends or family can also internalize these victim blaming beliefs. Religious communities may have views around sexuality that can complicate things. Lack of knowledge about their options. Don't realize the violation is, is an act of violence or abuse. They're on, um, only familiar with systems they might not trust, right? Everyone has a different relationship with community, um, community supports like the police, the district attorney's office and more. It's up to us to bridge that gap to make sure people know they have the right to report not ready to make something real or to share a shameful secret, right? So what is a trauma-informed response? Understanding the cumulative impacts of trauma, creating an environment of safety, promoting resiliency and healing, promoting effective and open communication, asking what happened rather than what is wrong with you, active listening. This is Savvy's perspective, right? The survivor is the expert of their survivorship and safety. You're assisting them in understanding their existing and newly introduced options. People don't really need to be saved or rescued, right? Part of recovering from an act of violence that robs you of your agency is by re-empowering that person to make decisions for themselves, right? We don't wanna push people to decide things when they're not ready. What are some supportive things you can say? I believe you, this is not your fault. I'm sorry you've been hurt. No one deserves to be treated this way, right? Especially when those victim blaming Mentality can affect any survivor. Nobody deserves to be treated this way. Just because you did X, Y, or Z doesn't mean you deserve to be hurt. How can I help? And that resources are available to you. I think I'm almost at time, um, but I'll go over some medical options for survivors really quickly. So part of what we do at Savvy is make sure people are supported in the emergency department. This applies to all survivors, including minors. Minors have a lot of rights um, in terms of accessing birth control, reproductive health care, and post-sexual assault services in, in New York City. If you report to the emergency department after sexual assault, there's a general physical exam just to make sure everything's okay. And then the evidence collection kit, which is a completely separate procedure, um, it can be taken up to 120 hours following a sexual assault. And there are also medication options that you can um, access at the emergency department, including HIV PEP, emergency contraception, STI treatments, and more. I will turn it back over to Victoria. Um, thank you so much for giving me that time. Thank you so much, Lindsay. That was so informative. We learned so much from you. And we look forward to any questions that the audience has to, to your enlightening us, enlightening us after our next presenter. So I would like to welcome Eric Rosenbaum to the podium, to the virtual podium. Thank you so much, uh, Assistant District Attorney and Bureau Chief. Thank you so much, Victoria. And um, I'd like to thank the center, of course, for this invitation. It, it, it's wonderful to you know, be invited to participate on these Denim Day events uh, where we get to really, not just, I think, raise awareness, but let survivors know that we care, that the that what happened to them matters, and that the world isn't exactly the same for us either. And we're here to try to help. Um, I, I'd also like to thank Savvy. Savvy has been a real game changer in the work that I do over the course of my career. Um, they've been transformative in terms of the experience that survivors have. And um, helping that bridge to healing, the first steps over it begin 
almost immediately um, after being contacted. Uh, it's really a change since I started this almost 30 years ago. The majority of my career has been spent in special victims, which for us, at least here in Queens, uh, would include all felony sexual assault cases against both adults and children, as well as physical violence against the elderly um, and physical violence at the felony level against children. Uh, so it's really cheery stuff. Um, and people say, you know, how do you how do you do this work? They really don't understand it when they say that to me or my staff. Um, Yes, we deal with some of the saddest and, and ugliest things that, um, you know, happen when the uh, threads of society unravel a bit. But that's not all we get to do. We get to witness the sort of amazing resilience of people, children and adults who have been through things that most of us haven't. Um, and with the proper support, um, we get to see them flourish into a different person they would have been if it never happened, uh, but a wonderful person nonetheless. When we do our jobs right, we're part of a healing process. And it's a blessing to be able to participate in that and, and to witness that and the, and the courage of people to both come forward and to assist one another um, in times of need when there's no obligation to help each other. Um, when you see a bystander, or a trusted friend or confidant of a survivor, um, be there for them. We get to see the very best in people. So it's not all just this dark stuff. Um, I, I've said, you know, what, what, what the cases are that we do, and every county is a little bit different in the way it's set up. Um, <clears throat> the assistants here in Queens, for instance, um, all have been trained in trauma-informed interviewing techniques. They're all certified forensic interviewers um, in the child cases. But what we've really come to see is that the forensic um, or the trauma-informed interviewing techniques and the forensic interviewing of children are not discrete silos of skills. These are skills that you could use for people of any age, having gone through any type of traumatic experience, in order to make your interactions with them from a law enforcement perspective more victim-centric um, and more likely to produce useful information in, a, um, in, in both a caring and effective way. So I'll talk to you a little bit about what that means. Um, first, though, let's talk about how a case even gets on our radar, right? How do you get to law enforcement? Uh, you can never be sort of, you can never start too far back at the beginning um, in helping survivors sort of understand, like, what am I getting into if I report this? Um, and what does report this mean? Do I go to the hospital and get help? And is that reporting it? Um, are the police going to show up? People don't know. And why would they know unless they've been in the situation? So we try to sort of train the people who are going to be on the front lines to be able to explain to the survivors what they can anticipate uh, if any number of decisions are made and thereby sort of empower them to make the most informed decision they can at that time. So cases come to the police in different ways. Of course, there's 911. Everyone knows 911. You call 911, the police come. Um, it's probably the worst way to get the police involved unless it's like a situation happening at the moment and there's a danger and a safety issue and you need immediate police response. You'll get that with 911. But the response you get is going to be patrol, that is uniforms um, with sector cars showing up. They're not experts in sexual assault. They could be very compassionate people but they're probably not that comfortable dealing with a sexual assault situation. And the case would relatively quickly be transferred over or at least get the involvement of the detective specializing in this called the Queen's Special Victim Squad. So when you call 911, uh, there's gonna be a bit of an emergency response. How else do cases begin then? Well, uh, someone can go to the hospital for treatment 
um, of any kind um, involving a sexual assault. And the hospital will talk to them about whether they want the police called and what would be involved in that. And then the hospital would reach out. People can also walk into a precinct. Um, again, not great because you don't know who you're going to be encountering. However, um, the Queen's Special Victim Squad here, and most jurisdictions have a special victim squad at this point, does know what they're doing. They take walk-ins. In New York City, there's also a police sexual assault hotline that operates 24-7. They will be a um, tour guide through the NYPD system and direct the survivor exactly to the person they should be speaking with. They'll make the connection. So I think that's that's kind of the best route to go is here in the city, the NYPD sexual assault hotline. Um, so you can see there's a number of different ways that the police could get involved. What does it mean if you're involving the police? Well, it means that you're keeping your options open and yet you're not really committing to anything. When the police come, detectives and interview the survivor, all of whom have been um, trained in trauma-informed interviewing techniques. There's always new staff coming who need the training, but by and large in New York City, they are trained. Um, they'll talk to the survivor about the possible next steps. If the situation does reach the level of criminality, the DA would get involved. There could be grand jury action and way down the road, if there's no disposition, there could be a trial, but 98% of cases don't go to trial. There's some kind of negotiation. The defendant accepts some degree of responsibility. So the, the commitment on the victim's part, even in a full blown prosecution is probably about four days over two years, but they'll never be made to do anything they don't want to do. If they really don't want to testify, if they really don't want to go to court, there's consequences. You know, we don't live in a fantasy world and, you know, survivors are smart. They know that. Um, but if they don't want to go to court, no one's going to drag them there. We'll see. Well, what's the next best option? Is an order of protection still doable? Is that feasible? Um I know the national statistic that Lindsay spoke about is 80% of people know their um, a, a abuser. I would say, having done this almost 30 years, I'd say in New York City, at least, it's closer to nine in 10. Um, stranger assaults are a very small fraction. Uh, most people are known to one another in some capacity. Uh, whether it is landlord, tenant, they've been on a date together, um, or they're in an intimate relationship already, uh, it's a work employee, worker, you know, kind of relationship, whatever it is, they know the person's name, they know something about them. They're not complete strangers. Um, it's complicated when people know each other, right? Because justice in those cases, when you assume it's jail, you're really shutting down um, the willingness of survivors to engage and really have much of a conversation in many, many cases, because while they want the abuse to stop um, or they're upset and angry and hurt and everything else about the abuse that's occurred, they don't always necessarily want the abuser to go to jail. Um, and there are other, um, there, there's intersectionality here, right? Because often there's mental illness at play there's substance abuse, there's an inability to deal with impulse control, anger management. There's all sorts of complications. There's fears based on, you know, residency and immigration status. There's this whole confluence of things. So while one might think, well, every victim of sexual assault would want their accuser punished and go to jail, sometimes they do, and sometimes we can achieve that. But very often what's wanted is help and for it to stop. We have those kinds of off ramps uh, from the criminal justice system available uh, to use as tools in the toolbox when we need them. So for instance, sometimes people can plead guilty to a crime and then a lower level thing that may or may not be a crime with the condition 
that they go to a year of sex offender counseling, which requires real participation, um, exercises, talking, and engagement. And if you're not doing those things, you're failing it and you're to be sentenced on the higher crime. But if you're doing it and you're getting the help that both the survivor and the district attorney's office felt was needed, then you'll get a benefit at the end, which is a more beneficial disposition. Sometimes there's substance abuse issues, which more often than not mask mental health issues. And we have mental health courts. What I'm trying to convey is that special victims work is no different than the rest of the criminal justice system in that you need maybe even more wraparound, comprehensive, holistic approaches to the situations. You need counselors um, early in the system, early in the process, helping the survivors understand um, that they are in control of what happens next, that their voice is heard. Um, you need these other services that I've discussed and you need prosecutors who understand the experience of a survivor. Um, you know, I'll finish by just talking about what are the biggest changes I've seen. The biggest changes over the course of my career, one is nuts and bolts, almost mathematical, that is forensic DNA. Um, forensic DNA has really transformed the alibi defense. There's only three defenses to sexual assault, right? Without knowing what the defendant said, there's only three. It wasn't me. That's the alibi. It was sex, but it was consensual. And there is no sex. She's just crazy and lying. So two of those three equal the victim is lying and the victim goes on trial. One of them, oh, she's mistaken. It's not me. DNA, it's pretty much removed alibi. It proves the defendant's identity. So he's then stuck with one of those other two. There was no sex. That's kind of off the table too, depending where you get the DNA from. So DNA has transformed the vast majority of sexual assault prosecutions into cases where the defense is it was consensual. And we've become very adept at putting together cases, focusing on proving how it was not consensual. Um, in putting this all together, one, DNA, one of these game changers was forensic DNA. The other was the trauma-informed interviewing techniques and the understanding of trauma. Lindsay alluded to the sort of old school way that many cases were evaluated, right? A victim came in and said, let's say I was raped. Okay, we're going to need you to come in tomorrow, look at some pictures. You'll come in, you look at the pictures, we're going to interview you again. And well, tell us more about it. I, I was raped. I was, there was also oral sexual conduct and some other things that happened. The old school way, we asked you that yesterday and you just told us you were raped. She's making this up as she goes along. This is, this is something else going on here. Okay, thanks for coming in. Case closed. Inconsistent to count. Well, we know that that is so fundamentally flawed. Um, it, it makes you want to weep for the cases that were closed that way in the past. DNA proved a lot of those cases actually were cases. And everyone had to rethink their approaches. You know, when we went and did our backlog projects and we found serial rapist DNA on cases of women whose cases were closed by the detectives in that, in that old era. So what do we do now? We take a trauma-informed approach and a victim-centric approach. People who go through trauma do not record things in the same way you do when you're not experiencing trauma. Chronology doesn't matter at all when all you're trying to do is survive. What happened first, next, after that, irrelevant. All you care about are those things that are central to your survival. What do I need to do to live? What color pants the perpetrator has? Where his hand went first? Which act occurred when? Irrelevant to whether you live or die, right? So your brain's not recording that. It takes time afterwards to be able to reassemble what memories you were able to process during the incident into something approaching a chronology 
and to even integrate facts that you didn't remember at first. So to account for this in a survivor-centric interview, you don't do it the old way, which is you lived through this. It was like you saw a movie. I need to see the same movie you saw to help you. So we're going to go a frame at a time until I can put all the frames together and see a movie. So the very first thing that happened, I just wanted to leave. Ma'am, I just told you, I need to know the first thing that happened. I don't know where you are and where you're trying to lead. Victim is going to freeze again. Say so like, I don't know how to do what they're asking me to do. And it sounds judgy the way the questions are coming. You don't do it that way. You ask a survivor on their terms after the background information, is it okay if we talked about, if we talk about what happened, why don't you tell me what you remember? It's not their job to assemble a movie for you. That's our job. We assemble it through the threads that they give us. We weave the tapestry. So a victim will say, I, you know, like they're just frozen. I had this situation and I'll ask them, tell me one thing you remember. Just one thing that you can't forget. And she said it was cold. And I asked her, tell me, tell me more about what was cold. My legs. Can you tell me what was making your legs cold? His hands. Tell me everything you remember about that. I was on the edge of the bed and I remember his hands everywhere they went, it was cold. Where was he? He was standing next to the bed. Were you able to see him? No. Can you tell me more about that? There were no lights on. Where were there no lights on? In the room. Tell me about the room. I'm using what she can provide to me to build the whole picture. It's a painstaking and slow process for someone who may be type A and want to go in a linear way. Victims don't do that. And it's not compassionate and it doesn't get you the truth. A victim centric way of teasing the threads out that they're able to access and provide has changed this entire field for me and the way we do business and the way we train our ADAs and the cops. Um, it is a much less traumatic experience uh, for a victim to go through that kind of interview process where she's the focus. And I keep saying she, you all know that I mean whoever the survivor is. So between trauma-informed interviewing and forensic DNA, I think we're in a very different place than we were 30 years ago or 20 years ago or even 15 years ago. Um, and I think we're doing it better. We're not doing it perfect. Um, you know, 20 years ago, we did it better than we did 50 years ago. There's always room for improvement, but we've never done it as well as we do it today. Um, and part of that has been learning from our advocate um, partners in this. It's been learning from the, um, the uh, psychological community and the doctors we work with and from the survivors themselves. Um, I could go on and on. I will stop because your questions are more interesting than anything I have to add. Um, I hope that was, um, you know, a little bit informative of how we approach things with the underlying ethos always being, you are believed. I'll figure out if it equals a crime or not. It's got nothing to do with whether you are believed because you are. And before anyone leaves my office, we actually practice saying that. Because I say, when you get home, it's like going to the doctor and getting a lot of information. You don't remember most of it. I need to know the one thing you will remember when you think about meeting with the DA and with the police is that you were believed. I need, I need to hear you say it unless you really don't feel that way. And then we're going to talk about it. And that's how the conversations end. Um, and we didn't do that a long time ago, but we definitely do now. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> well, thank you. My, my biggest takeaway is that last, uh, that last utterance before ending with, with a survivor that you are believed. And the other takeaway that even though this is a horrible occurrence in human beings' lives, that we do see the best in people that care about the survivor and how the survivor can be so resilient. So 
Those are my biggest takeaways right now. And so thank you for that. Now we have a question in our chat from Cherry. Cecilia, would, would you like to offer to unmute our people who are asking questions? Sherry, I can unmute you or, or I can ask the question myself. You, you can just ask the question. I'm in the library at the moment. Okay, very good. I wanted to give you the option. So Sherry asks, I went to the doctor for STI HIV testing after my former friend confessed having non-consensual unprotected sex with me while I was intoxicated. And the doctor told me that was a crime called stealthing. When I went to the police precinct, they denied me a report and said there was nothing they could do. What are my options now? Um, I'll answer the legal part of it um, in a more general way because I don't want to discuss any particular you know, detailed case. Uh, that I don't really know all the facts about. But um, the stealthing part of it, I'll talk about first. Uh, first of all, the doctor went to medical school, not law school. So I don't like when people leave their professional lanes because they tend to provide misinformation. I won't try to treat someone for an STI, and I prefer they not advise people on the law. But they did, and we got some lines crossed, so let's correct it. Stealthing is a concept usually applied to the idea of someone who is given consent to sexual activity so long as the male involved wears um, a prophylactic, a, a condom. And when discovering halfway through the, the act or afterwards that they didn't wear a condom, um, there's a question as to is that truly consent that was given? they stealthily got the consent and then had sex without the condition they said that they would meet. Some states have tried to pass laws, um, which they call these like stealthing laws. I don't know if California's passed. Um, New York does not have that law. In New York, the law is that consent is consent. Um, and there can't really be con conditions attached to it uh, in terms of criminality. Um, I'm not taking a position on whether that's the right or wrong law. Um, it is the law uh, that we just have to deal with. Um, now, intoxication is a more complicated subject. Um, I've been working very hard for years to close what we call the intoxication loophole in New York, um, which basically the law right now is you have to be unconscious or asleep. Um, for someone having intercourse or other sexual activity with you for it to be criminal. You can't be in a drug-induced blackout where you're awake, but just not recording what's going on. Often, someone who's voluntarily intoxicated has no idea if they're in a blackout or if they actually were unconscious. So how could they tell the police whether the elements of a crime are made out? All they know is if I were in my right mind, I would never have consented with this individual and they took advantage of me. That's the loophole is where they don't know what state they were actually in, nothing can be done. The loophole we're trying to close is by creating a reasonable person standard in the position of the defendant. Someone in the defendant's position, would they reasonably know that the victim is not in a position to give consent? Their eyes are rolling back in their head. They're babbling. They're not forming sentences. They can't walk unassisted. They just threw up all over themselves. Any reasonable person would know this person cannot consent. We're not saying that drunk people can't have sex. Drunk people can have all the sex they want. We're talking about people who are beyond that, who have lost their capacity to understand the nature of what they're even doing. 
there's some traction in the legislature. There's some resistance as well. We will continue fighting this fight um, because I think it's one worth having um, over and over and over again uh, until until we get something done. So that's my answer from the law enforcement side of things. Very crazy. Um, I, I don't know if you could hear me before. I was trying to talk uh, when I was on my phone, and I, I don't think you could hear me. I just wanted to make sure that I, I do mention that, like what I, I echo that what Victoria said that even though this is such a heavy topic and it's not pleasant to talk about it or deal with it, especially for victims, your knowledge and your like your work. Um, leaves us with such a you know like it uplifts us uh and like all they all our mission as well um i thank you so much for for what you just shared and i thank you for fighting for continuing to fighting and for making this so much better than what it was 50 years ago and for having that mindset of like we will continue to make it better we do have women that come to us and, and like what you're telling us is something that we will be telling. We, you are believed. So thank you for that. Uh, but Lindsay, I think I cut you off and I'm sorry for that. I just, I just, I couldn't talk before and I needed to say thank you um, uh, before I lost the opportunity again. Lindsay, go ahead. Yeah, I wanna, yeah. I wanna, oh, sorry. I think there's an echo because of the sound. Is it better? Okay. I just wanted to say that I'm really sorry to hear that that happened to you. Um, person put it in the chat. I'm not sure if it's Cherry or Sherry. It's really saddening that you experienced that from somebody that you trusted. And I can say that if you want to seek support from Savvy, we're here to support survivors. Um, and there can be some advocacy done at this, at the, you know, at Savvy to try and talk about if there are more options for you and talk more about your case in general, and more specifically with an individual counselor. Um, I feel like this is the essential problem of sexual violence is that there are so many cases that either the criminal justice process can't or won't handle because of the circumstances involved, whether it's evidence or whether it's um, for whatever reason, they were not able to take that report. Where there's so many more social solutions we need to look for to hold, hold people who do this kind of behavior accountable from community standpoint. And I I feel like this rape crisis movement is really focused on survivors, which is great, but we need more people at the table who are looking at what is the behavior of perpetrators? How are we holding them accountable? If the criminal justice system isn't the right fit for that situation because of the way the criminal justice process works, what are the alternatives being built for restorative justice, for transformative justice, to find alternative ways that survivors can hold perpetrators accountable? Um, and those are things that are being built over time. I'm not really at those tables because I'm at the survivor table, but I hope that there could be more options out there for people who have been, you know, are not able to access the criminal justice process. So I would say reach out to a program. If you're not in New York City, there's other programs that we can refer you to. I'll put my email in the chat. So you can email you so me. Much like that. To yeah. resources. Um, I was going to ask that. How does she contact uh, you, Lindsay, your someone at Savvy? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, in line with what you just said, like we are so lucky to have such an amazing advocate for sexual assault uh, as our DA, Melinda Katz. Uh, she did approach us recently asking uh, if we could partner for a prevention um, program. And so we are going to be talking about that. Like, and I, I hope that we have more elected officials that are, um, you know, are big in like, as she is. And she has a team as she has with people like Eric to make this issue better for survivors. You know, Lindsay, I do have to add after what you said, um, and I should have said this before, I'm sorry I didn't, um, specifically Sherry to what you had posted. It's not together altogether clear to me that there isn't criminality in what you've described. And it's something that if you want to um, discuss with the police, um, talk to one of the advocates and they can connect you with the Queens Special Victim Squad if you're in Queens or whichever borough um, and explore whether or not there is something um, that can be done. I, I don't know in your case if there is or isn't, but it sounds like the doctor gave advice that made you feel you shouldn't go forward and explore that. And that's unfortunate. 
Um, so if you still feel like you might want to talk to an advocate and then together perhaps call call the special victim squad of your county and see if Eric, you can set up with something. Would you mind putting that uh, contact in the chat uh, so Sherry can uh, have it handy, like uh, the, the either an email? Yeah. Or Let me see what I can email. find. I'll, I'll post it now. Thank you so much. So we encourage our audience to write any other questions in the chat. Uh, I do have a question about the um, the DNA kits, the rape kits. That's all I've been hearing for years that they're sitting on shelves. And I not do in New York. Yeah, there's so it's not in New York, but there may be others uh, from yes. from other states and. Uh, but I understand there is a nationwide uh, nonprofit that is just doing that, making sure that nationally these these kits are off the shelves and that prosecutions do go forward. I'm happy to hear that. I, I just hope it plays out. Yeah, let me just say that New York City's backlog was the first in the nation to be cleared um, in 2000 and 2000. We sent 16,000 rape kits from open or closed cases. No, no, we didn't make a distinction for DNA analysis. And from those, we prosecuted hundreds and hundreds of cases across the city. Um, those That project was completed by 2004. We have not had a rape kit backlog in New York for almost 20 years. Um, those people who go to hospitals as uh, for treatment, but don't want those kits released to law enforcement yet, those kits obviously can't be tested because they weren't released, but they are now being stored um, and the survivor could change their mind um, over the, the days or weeks or months or even years that follow. You know, the passage of time compromises how much can be done, but depends on the situation, right? Maybe a lot can be done. So those kits haven't been tested, but it's only because we can't test them. So the good news for New York, New York City in particular, is we have zero backlog. Thank you so much for that information. I would like to ask Lindsay a question. I was introduced to uh, Mount Sinai Savvy through Zanta International, uh, Zanta Club of Greater Queens. And then later on, we collaborated with BQ Now and Zanta Club of New York. So we have a long history with Savvy and with every one of your staff members, you're all so informative and, and such great advocates. I'd like you to share a little more detail about your advocate program. That is what left such an impression with me that survivors are not alone in an emergency room, not alone in a police precinct. Please share that. Sure thing. Okay. Um, we're currently recruiting for October advocate training. We just wrapped up a training this spring. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about that. Thank you so much for inviting that to the conversation. We have a great program where anybody who's interested um, can apply and be interviewed and then go through a 40 hour training. You don't have to have any previous advocacy skills. Um, it's really a, it's really a ground up zero to 60 training, where we train people to respond to the emergency department. Um, essentially what would happen is a survivor enters the emergency department and identifies themselves as a survivor or during the course of treatment may identify themselves as a survivor to the staff. And the staff will say, would you like us to call an advocate? At that point, the staff would contact Savvy through our, through our um, 24 hour line and say, we have a survivor here who'd really like an advocate to talk to. Separate from that, there also may be a safe examiner who comes out to collect evidence if that person is interested in evidence collection, right? It might not be for everybody, but it is a completely voluntary process in which a safe examiner can come out to the hospital, collect that evidence, and it doesn't trigger a police investigation, right? It can be stored for up to 20 years. It's up to that survivor if and when they want to discuss this matter with the police. Um, and that advocate will spend the uh, entire time with that survivor. The, the kit can take a long time, the evidence collection kit, it can take four, six, seven hours sometimes. Um, so it's something that is really helpful to have an advocate there just to talk to, to say, do you need a sandwich? Do you want some water? 
making small talk. Um, my original position in this field was advocate. I was a volunteer advocate seven years ago. And that's how I got involved. And I, it opened up a big door to me for this work. And, you know, sometimes you're just talking about what that person's favorite sandwich is because they're tired. It's two in the morning and, you know, they're there for seven hours. So it's a really great program. If people are interested, please reach out. I put my email in the chat. Um, I think that it's it's a great resource for the community and it means a lot to survivors who have that support. So then connect with resources afterward as well. Savvy will call every individual we see and see if they need any support, if they'd like to talk to a counselor, if they need help connecting to a police department and more. So thank you. What all. is the difference, Lindsay, from that, uh, from, from when, uh, when Eric was saying like uh, I, victims being asked, uh, what was he wearing? What was the first thing that happened to what you were talking now? to make the uh, victim feel welcome, believed, and heard. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, we definitely work on supporting um, that training that is so important that Eric talked about, how much improvement there has been, and also helping a survivor understand that they have the, what their rights are when talking to the police and why they may ask certain questions and help them with that, right? So it's really great to have them there. I will say the example I used was really meant to frame how things used to be. So I should say there has been a lot of improvement on trauma-informed response and making sure that at any point a survivor encounters a system, they're treated with dignity and respect. We can't control the outcome of investigations, criminal cases, and more, but treating that person with respect can be really helpful. Studies show that if a survivor feels disbelieved, it can increase their chances of long-term PTSD. Every time they encounter a provider that's supportive and believing them, it actually helps them recover emotionally. So it's so important um, to have that training. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I just want to um, respond to um, Beverly. Yes, we definitely will send the resources via email to everyone who attended. And this um, webinar, if you want to share with anyone who would be interested, um, we will post it on our website on under past events uh, in a couple of weeks or before that, hopefully. Uh, Victoria, and, uh, one more I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, so I don't want to make it that long. We could be talking about this for hours, days, months, and years, and we will. Uh, but I, today, I want to be respectful of, um, of everyone's time. So I'll let Victoria close. Thank you all so much for coming. And like, just one thing, like uh, after you mentioned that, like we, we try to leave with a little action for our organization and everyone that comes through us. Um, I mean, uh, definitely we will be using your phrase, Eric, and your belief uh, is going to be adopted by the Center for the Women of New York um, for every time we have a conversation. And uh, what Lindsay just mentioned, uh, making small talk and, and, and hearing, listening actively to what victims need in the moment uh, to make that uh, very difficult and challenging moment, time, trauma, like, a little better um we will we will take that into consideration but um yeah I'll, I'll let victoria uh close thank you eric thank you uh to our da melinda katz that has an amazing team and lindsay what your program is doing that advocate uh program is incredible uh we are building our program uh like in, in these areas so you are an amazing role model and we would love to hear more about that at some point we'll connect if you visit cwny.org, right on our homepage right now for the month of April is a link to all of our sexual assault awareness resources. If you visit any time after April, just type in after cwny.org, type in sexual assault and you will be led to all of our resources. But again, this, this uh, video and uh, the link and the resources will be sent to the attendees. So again, thank you to both presenters for enlightening us and for making us aware and to remember to say, I believe you. Yes, very important. We will not forget this. And please do uh, take your own actions. Lindsay mentioned that there's that gap. So perhaps thinking about how to help survivors in a way that uh, you can and to create awareness of, of the DA's programs in the five boroughs and 
Mount Sinai Savvy's program. Please do spread the word. Yeah, and if, if you don't know, uh, you know, like if, you, if you're wondering about one of our resources and you'd like to uh, be referred to something, we do referrals. Uh, I know we didn't share the list of programs verbally, but uh, we are happy to refer you to what you, what you need. If we don't uh, offer that service, like we we will be referred, like we will refer you to Savvy or the district's attorney's uh, office. And, uh, so contact us and we'll guide you in the right direction. And here are phone numbers, feel free to take a picture or a screenshot um, of our contact information, of our phone numbers and email. Thank you all uh, for coming. Have a safe uh, rest of your day. Um, we'll, be, we'll be in touch. And wear, wear your jeans today. Thank Let you the world us. know.